You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Options Bootcamp is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. NASDAQ, tech forward, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your options bootcamp drill instructors, Mark Longo, Dan Passarelli, and Jill Malandrino. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for your weekly educational fix here on the network. Yes, it's time for Options Boot Camp. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as, of course, from this fine network upon which you are consuming this program right now. If you're liking the show, and I can I see a lot of you are, which we're very thankful for. Glad you guys really liking the return of Options Boot Camp. Make sure you head out there to your platform of choice, wherever it is, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get it, YouTube, and leave comments, leave reviews. Other people can continue to find this program. As we're going to see in a little bit, Options Education Perhaps more important than ever out there these days. So keep those reviews coming so new people can continue to discover this program many years after its launch. We love all of you guys. All the new folks who join us, welcome. And of course, keep those questions comments, and comments coming. We do love to hear from all of you out there. And let's see who we're going to hear from today on the show. First off, joining me, my compatriot here in all things options boot camp drill instructing the black-headed one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli, the founder of Market Taker Mentoring, as well as the author of uh, one or two options books out there. Mr. P, welcome back to the program, sir. Hey, Mark. Always great to be back. Excited about today's show. Yeah, it should be a fun one. And also joining us, holding down the NASDAQ hot seat, is a newcomer to Options Boot Camp, even though he has been on the network in the past. Even though it's been a while, I think, since he's been on with us as well. He is Eric Metz, the Chief Investment Officer over there at Spider Rock Advisors. Eric, welcome to Options Boot Camp. Appreciate it, Mark. Looking forward to it. And Eric, I know you've been on the network before, but this is your first time on Options Boot Camp. And as we've said before, there's a huge influx of new people discovering the show in these crazy, turbulent times who probably aren't familiar with you or Spider Rock. So give them a quick overview of your background in the option space and what it is you guys do at Spider Rock Advisors. Sure, great. Uh, personal background, uh, been in the industry about 20 years. Uh, began on the floor of the CBOE with a local uh, firm here called uh, Chicago Trading Company. Navigated the proprietary community of Chicago uh, volatility trading for, for quite some time and then uh, founded Spider Rock Advisors to really bring solutions and derivatives based strategies to, to retail and private wealth. Well, we're going to do a lot of that today, especially the former there as we head into our basic training. All right, Boot, it's time to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? Yes, you're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Pull in. Prepare to learn. Yes, sir. 
I do love that intro, especially around this time of year. It gets festive, makes you think about Fourth of July and all the holidays out there. Maybe those holidays are a little bit less festive these days. Can't really get out with the crew and have a big barbecue the way you used to, but we'll be back doing that again, I'm sure, sometime in the near future. Of course, basic training, the portion of the show where we break down some basic options concepts and explain it for you guys out there. Maybe you're a retail stock guy. You're thinking about dipping your toes into the options waters. Maybe you've already played around with options. Maybe you got burned. Maybe you want to just get a little bit deeper into those waters. Either way, we've got you covered. We're going to go very basic today, but as we've seen, unfortunately, uh, to our dismay recently, it's very basic, but also obviously very misunderstood. And as we've all learned in the last week or so, a lack of options education can have very, very tragic consequences. Now, we've said here on the show many times, options education is important, is important. It's a mantra we repeat frequently on the show because it's true, yet I don't think any of us really thought we could see it play out in such stark and dire contrast as we did over the course of the past week. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about, listeners, uh, there's a very sad story coming outside Chicago here in Naperville, a suburb, uh, where a a young, about 20-year-old person, Alex Kearns was his name. He was a Robin Hood customer, and clearly he had gotten into options trading. In particular, it seemed like he was selling put spreads, and he came into his account one day and saw he had a negative balance of around $750,000. That's a lot of money. That'll spook anybody, particularly if you're someone 20 years old, just kind of starting out and investing. I think your account balance was only 16000 or something going into it. So this was terrifying to him. And tragically, he ended up taking his own life as a result. He drove in front of a train. So this was a pretty horrific story on every level. Obviously, one we had to discuss here on the show today because our focus here is options education for the basic retail customer. Maybe trying to set some light on what happened here and what you should do if it happens to you. But first, before we get to that, Dan, let's start with you because you've been in the education space for a long time. I'm sure this story came across your desk and I'm sure you were pretty disheartened by it like the rest of us were. What were your thoughts when you saw this this lack of option education literally led to the end of someone's life, sir? Yeah, it's such a sad and tragic story. Um, I, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's terrible, you know? Um, and as you know, Mark, I've been, um, you know, working with brokerage firms for a long time and uh, encouraging them to to do their own options education. Um, my argument then was, I mean, you don't want customers blowing up and losing a million dollars because they don't know what they're doing. It's good for you to educate your customers. Um, but, you know, this just takes it to another level. I mean, if a brokerage firm let somebody blow up because they didn't educate them and they lose a million dollars. They can always make more money, but uh, this can't be turned around. No, there's no coming back from this, uh, unfortunately. Eric, um, same question for you. Obviously, it's a somber note for you to make your first appearance here on Options Bootcamp. But if you saw this story, if you have any thoughts on that you want to share with our audience, feel free. And also, it seems like the crux of this issue was getting assigned early on uh, some short puts or indeed put spreads. If you have any thoughts on that scenario as well, and maybe how you guys deal with it over there at Spider Rock, have at it. Sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, tragic is an, is an understatement here. I, w- I would say, you know, without getting the granular details of what actually occurred in his account, um, you know, education is paramount to the entire industry, retail most specifically, um, as that education may or may not exist there. So, you know, I think uh, at least in the press, I've seen Robin Hood take, you know, uh, the, the steps that they're looking to take to, to address the educational side. But to, uh, to Dan's earlier point, you know, um, this, this can't be reversed, and it's extremely, extremely unfortunate. So when we saw this, obviously this was tragic, and we obviously want to prevent future occurrences like this. So we still don't know the exact details of what happened. Robin Hood has been a little bit tight-lipped. There are privacy concerns, even though we do know the individual's name, and a lot of it has been reported. Some outlets have actually gotten screenshots of the account balances, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. So we're going to kind of piece together what we think happened and what you, as a traditional options customer, should do or should think if this scenario uh, should happen to you. So it seemed like he was selling put spreads, credit put spreads. You're collecting money to sell these, obviously, in Amazon. Amazon, obviously, a very pricey stock. And interesting things could happen when that stock moves around a little bit. So we kind of created a little basic example here for you. So if you see something like this in your account, maybe, hopefully, you won't panic and go down the same route that's uh, led to tragic consequences there. 
uh, with Mr. Kern. So let's go back to our favorite example, XYZ. In this case, it's not trading 2000 like Amazon. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> let's keep it uh, 50 bucks. Uh, so in this case, you say, you know, you think, it, you know, you might want to harvest a little premium. You're okay. Maybe if it drops to 45 around there, maybe picking up a little bit of the stock. So you decide to sell. You want to sell the 45, 40 put spread, a $5 put spread. You know, from listening to this show, from doing your own basic education, the most that spread can be worth is $5. You sell it for $2. So you know your max risk is three dollars. That's probably what Alex thought he knew going into that as well. And when he saw that massive debit, it scared him. So you think, okay, collect two bucks, or in this case, you do it ten times, so you collect two thousand dollars. Or remember, that's two dollars on a hundred contracts, so it's two times a hundred, and then times ten because you're doing it ten times, so total of two thousand dollars. And you're gonna get some sort of credit of that amount to your kind. Not gonna get all of it right away because your broker's gonna hold on to some of it in case something else happens, but you'll see some sort of credit to your account. You think, okay, that's good, and if it drops, the most I can lose is three grand. And then you go off, do something else, and over the next few days or a week or so, let's say XYZ drops a little bit, drops to like 47. And then someone decides they got to get the heck out of Dodge. They got to exercise their puts early. It's a fairly rare scenario. You're not going to see this very often because there really aren't a lot of good reasons to exercise a, an option early, let alone a put. You see sometimes on the call side, you want to buy a stock to capture a dividend. Uh, but outside of that, exercising a put early, usually it's a bit of a panic move. Usually it works out for you, the person who's on the receiving end of this. But let's say in this case, someone panics and they exercise those uh, 45 strike puts when the stock is still above it. Stock is still 47. And now all of a sudden you lock into your account and you say, wait a minute, what's going on? And instead of seeing some portion of that $2,000 credit you thought you had in there, you see a debit for somewhere in the ballpark of around $45,000. Remember, of course, you have to buy the strike at 45. It's a 10 lot, so it's 1,000 shares, so 45 times 1,000. It's pretty basic math there. The broker is probably not going to debit you for all of that. It could be on margin, so half of that, or depends on your account size, what type of broker you have, what kind of margin treatment you have. A lot of different variables go into that magical number of, of how much your debit is going to be. But somewhere in the neighborhoods, worst case is going to be $45,000. Obviously, you didn't plan for that. You see that. You're terrified. And now, obviously, we don't want you to take drastic action after that. So a couple of things to keep in note. First off, stay calm. Nothing has really changed about the risk profile of your trade. Remember, you still have those long puts, in this case, on the 40 strike. So those are 10 contracts. They equal 1,000 shares. So you're stopped out still to the downside of that 40 strike. So you're not going to lose anything more than that $3,000 you were initially on the hook for in case the spread goes out to its max value. So that, despite that crazy debit, your risk profile really hasn't changed. And we do wish, obviously, someone had explained this to Alex before he took such uh, drastic consequences as a result. And also, as I mentioned earlier, being assigned early, usually it's a panic move on someone's part. Usually that means it could be a beneficial thing for you. For example, in this scenario, if you get this, you see this debit, uh, you actually could have a, a stock position in your account for a couple of days that you didn't really pay for yet. That's what that debit's for. So the stock rallies over that time, you get to keep that, uh, that benefit. Which, so it's a little bit of a free flyer to the upside in this case on stock. And then the, on the third thing to keep in mind is you're not on the hook just because you see that debit. doesn't mean they're going to come to you saying you, we demand $45,000 in this case or $750,000 in Alice's case. That's just what the debit would be if you wanted to keep the stock that they're going to assign to you. you have a, usually it's three days. It depends, again, on the broker and how they've changed that settlement a little bit. But usually you had a few days at least there for you to put, deposit that money if you want to keep the stock. Otherwise, your broker will liquidate for it for you. So it's, eventually in the past, it was viewed as kind of like a bit of a free flyer on the stock. Because you have the puts to the downside to stop you out, and you have all the upside that you can get over that couple of days out there. Uh, so, Dan, any thoughts uh, on this? You know, have you seen people come to you in the past with this exact same problem? Have you counseled anybody about maybe to walk them off the ledge of they see these insane debits and a spread or a trade they thought was otherwise very risk limited, Dan? Yeah, we have a whole course on it um, because it can be very confusing. You know, like. Um, we spend a lot of our time on this show, Mark, uh, as far as options education goes, talking about, you know, the Greeks and volatility and how different positions work. But this idea of understanding those numbers on your brokerage platform, oh, it's so important because those numbers can be really, really confusing. And, um, you know, I mean, if you don't, you can really misinterpret it. I mean, there's, uh, you know, just thinking about all, I mean, I've got a few brokerage accounts, you know, and all of them, if you look at what the cash balance is, sometimes there's like many different categories of cash. And it's like sometimes I don't even know which one I'm supposed to be looking at, you know, and um, and sometimes they'll call it different things that 
are not really intuitive. And so, um, yeah, it, it's really, really important to understand what all those numbers are uh, in, in their direct proportion to their relevance to you. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like most brokerage firms go out of their way to obscure the math that goes into whatever the margin number it is, whether it's your account buying power, or in this case, your debit, the actual calculations that go into that number. I've lost track of how many people have hit us up over the years. What does this mean, my buying? How do they calculate this? What is my debit? They really need to be more transparent. We'll get to that in a little bit there. Eric, I'm curious. I know you play around these days in a lot of mostly institutional accounts with so the margin treatment. Everything else is going to be a little bit different than in your traditional Joe 10 lot retail account. But do you have any thoughts on like what Dan was just saying, kind of that magical voodoo number of, of the margin slash buying power in your account and how sometimes brokers maybe obscure that, in this case at least, Eric, with tragic consequences? Yeah, I mean, I can touch on a few points here. Uh, we'll stick to your, your very uh, simple example of, you know, the 45, 40 put spread with a $50 stock. So first and foremost, I, and Mark, you hit the nail on the head, your risk hasn't changed, right? So it's, it's, I would say, translated from a short put into just long stock, which is actually beneficial for the account holder. Um, but, you know, the brokerage houses will view that as a balance sheet transaction. And that's where that debit balance comes from, right? Um, so a few ways to think about this, or I would say react to it, um, you know, one, if you have the balance and, and you know, you want to ride the upside of the security, uh, assuming you have the cash or the collateral, you can you can just hold it and you're in a better spot than you were, you know, the day prior. The other thing is the early exercise is this mystery in, in retail, which is actually extremely mathematical and it shouldn't be a mystery at all. Um, somebody who rationally exercises these options, you, you would only do it on the short put side if the security became, you know, hard to borrow. Um, and then on the call side, it would really be around a dividend or an exercise. And so in reality, what happened here is somebody gave this account holder uh, some amount of free money because there was still time value left in that option. So view it as a positive thing, uh, first and foremost, in, in both examples, A, you have the full upside in the stock from here on out. Uh, but B, like they, they, they eroded your time uh, faster than the actual calendar did. So if you had 30 days left in this option, um, you know, some, some account holder gave you those 30 days for, for free. So they gave you optionality back. Um, you know, and at, at the end of the day, at, you know, the very worst case, close your stock and close your long put. Um, and, you know, live to fight another day and go, go assess how you want to reposition yourself. So it is paramount again on that, on that educational side to know kind of the logistics and, and the operational, uh, side of how the, the mechanics here work. And that's the ultimate tragedy of this. Is he, you're right. He was gifted this position effectively. He had a, a free swing at the bat to the upside in the stock, at least for a couple of days. You're right. He got all of his time premium accelerated. That's another reason why people don't traditionally exercise their options early. Listeners, remember, options have that time premium, the volatility premium, interest rate premium, all those things that are baked into the extra amount beyond the intrinsic value of the option. When you exercise an option early, you lose all of that. All you're getting it for is that intrinsic value. So there's really never as Eric alluded to, a mathematical reason to do it outside of exercising calls early to capture a dividend. So on the put side, again, it's usually some sort of panic move or it's a forced liquidation or something along those lines, usually things that tend to be beneficial to you. So if someone had bothered maybe to explain that uh, to this poor gentleman here, maybe circumstances would have been different. He could have said, woohoo, I got this little free flyer, or at the very least, he could have closed everything out without really taking additional loss. And yet he saw that debit and tragic consequences unfolded here. So obviously this is a horrible scenario that unfolded. That's why we wanted to just clarify it here. This is a very simplistic example. Obviously, listeners, there's a lot of voodoo goes into the calculating of those numbers. But moral of the story, if you're doing some sort of risk-limited short premium strategy, like in this case, short put spreads, and you are assigned early on the short leg and you see this crazy debit, don't freak out. Remember, you have a risk-mitigated position out there. It's a little bit scarier if you're just selling puts and you're assigned early, you don't have that stop out because then that could be a situation where, yeah, it's a little bit of a gift and a free flyer, but they're probably panicking for a reason. The stock might be heading down pretty aggressively and you weren't aware of it. Maybe something happened in the after hours. So that's why we always recommend having that spread leg to protect yourself on the downside. Here, You don't want to wake up and discover you're on the hook for a bunch of stock and the stock is down 30% mysteriously overnight on some random development. So having the other leg of the spread in this case protects you out there. Any final thoughts there on this, Mr. Dan, on this, this obviously 
tragic event uh, for everybody involved? No, yeah, I just – Eric has such a great explanation. You know, um, uh, it's just you, you got to understand this stuff, man. You know, I mean it's uh, – uh, Money is uh, is something you can always make more of, you know. But um, but but, it, but it's important, you know. I mean, people people can lose their life savings, you know, and that kind of thing. So um, if you want to drive a car, you go to driving school, you know. Like anything, <laughs> any other dangerous thing that like could benefit you as being an asset to you, but also has a, a dangerous side to it. Like we know we should take classes on and we should learn how to use these things. Uh, and, and this is no different. Options are a wonderful tool that can help you really control your risk. Um, but, you know, you, you just got to train, get, get some training. Well, Eric, let's maybe leave our listeners on a little bit of a more uh, happier, I don't know, maybe not happier, but a different note. Indeed, this is your first time here on Options Bootcamp. We got so, uh, so caught up in this tragic story for obvious reasons out here. But you haven't been on, I think the last time you were on was, was quite some time ago and certainly not on this program. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but a lot has happened in the broad market and indeed in the world since your last appearance. You know, spoiler alert, the world kind of fell apart since the last time we chatted. We obviously had a massive sell-off leading into the big tumult there in March and an equally massive, equally unprecedented rally back up to effectively new all-time highs over the course of the past month. So walk us through from your perspective what those last few months have been like from an overall vol perspective, from a position management perspective, as well as what, what your thoughts are on what we're seeing out there right now in this, this crazy race back up the V-shaped recovery here, Eric. Sure, Mark. No, it's uh, interesting slash roller coaster slash tumultuous, uh, all, all words that describe it, but not accurately enough. Um, you know, we were heading into to what we'll call the global pandemic sell-off with, with a relatively muted volatility environment. Um, when you get a regime shift involved such that we just had, um, you have to put it in, in context of, of what historically that looks like. And, and one of the biggest, uh, I would say, fun facts that we've gathered in, in extracting data over the last couple of months is, it took roughly 14 business days to sell off in 2020 during the global pandemic, what it took almost 200 days in 2008. Um, and from a volatility perspective, that's just speed of sell-offs, right? Um, and volatility can be measured in a variety of ways. A lot of people use the barometer of the VIX. Um, you know, the VIX jump here was registering top five. Uh, there were actually the, the, the largest percentage move I believe was January, February of 2018, so somewhat recent. But, uh, you know, I'll categorize that as a structural event, not a macro event. So it's, it's been a huge regime shift. I think the volatility environment is here to stay for a lot of uh, macro reasons. I mean, the, the virus itself is coming out with statistics, and, and the ambiguity surrounding that is just massive. Nobody can actually forecast this with any degree of certainty, which will then translate into, you know, volatility persisting in the market for some time. But then, you know, you have, you have other backdrops. And, Mark, you mentioned V-shaped recovery. Like, why did the V-shaped recovery happen? Well, the government stepped in in a variety of sorts, both fiscally and monetarily. Uh, and when you see that, right, calculating the effect of that is also difficult. And, and, and people's models have, have variation to them. So you have this confluence of factors that are going into people's forecasts. And the forecasts just come out drastically different, whether it be earnings on the S&P, whether it be earnings on Microsoft, or whether it be, you know, what government programs and stimulus effects actually have to people's bottom lines and what that does to bankruptcy or, or default rates. So the macro climate is, you know, as confusing as I think any professional or retail investor has seen probably in their investing lifetimes. And, you know, what what the result of that is, is volatility. So, you know, selling calls to produce income to take advantage of high, heightened vol. Um, SKU is, which is a relationship in, you know, different strikes. Um, is, is all over the board on any given day. So there's a lot of opportunity from a trading perspective. But structurally speaking, you know, the, the volatility is elevated. I don't see it dissipating anytime soon. And, uh, you know, try to build a prudent portfolio using that as a tailwind for you, I think, is, is you know, where, where we make our livelihood. Well said, sir. Unfortunately, that music means we've come up against it. Uh, Eric, I want to thank you for joining us. I promise we'll have you back on. In unhappier circumstances on another episode of Options Bootcamp. But we'll also get to more of your questions coming up on your next episode. We'll have a whole mail call palooza listener, so don't worry. But obviously, 
there were reasons why we had to focus on this this week. If you guys have questions about all this kind of math and how it unfolds and this kind of early assignment exercise type risk, hit us up. You guys certainly aren't shy of doing that, and we'll try to answer them in future episodes out there. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Eric, we'll start with you as our guest. If folks are intrigued by what you guys are cooking up over there in Spider Rock, um, where should they go? What should they do? Sure. I mean, our website does a pretty good job of outlining kind of where we uh, where we traffic and kind of our strategies and services, uh, www.spiderrockadvisors.com. And, uh, you know, looking forward to hearing from you uh, should you have an inquiry. Spiderrockadvisors.com. Check them out over there if you have questions. And judging by the input we get on this network on a daily basis, a lot of you have a lot of questions. It's understandable. This is one of the craziest periods in market history at full stop. So if you don't have questions, I'd be a little bit surprised. Maybe if you do, you want to hit up Eric and the team over there at Spider Rock. They can help you out. Or you can also go to the black-hatted one, Mr. Passarelli, sir. If folks are intrigued, they have questions, and we all know they have a lot of them these days, and want to hit you up at Market Taker, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, I'm always glad to help. I definitely have people occasionally uh, who listen to the show and email me with a question. Uh, if I can help in any way, you know where to find me. Uh, you can email me at dan at markettaker.com. You can head on over to our website, markettaker.com, hit the Contact Us link, and uh, glad to help. Check them out, markettaker.com, to learn more. At the very least, listeners, before something tragic like this occurs for you, if you have a serious question like this, hit us up. We'll try to, quite literally in this case, walk you off the ledge and provide you with a little bit of information on what's going on, hopefully, in your account. And on behalf of... Of the Black Hatted One and Mr. Eric Metz and our friends over there in NASDAQ land and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for sending in those questions. Don't worry, we'll get to more of them next time. And in fact, we'll see you back here next week for more Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. NASDAQ. Tech Forward. Leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.